Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Reading Group. We have a nice wee panel here today. One second. I forgot to turn off my audio. One second. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, we have a nice wee panel with, panel with us here today. Uh, we have from all the way from Sweden, we've got Emmanuel. How's it going, Emmanuel? I'm good. All the way from Sweden. <laughs> you and I are probably That's right. the closest to each other uh, geographically, but but yeah. <laughs> yep. All the way from Sweden. I'm here. I'm so yeah, we've got no mathematics and no tables in, in this uh series. So Emmanuel, you might yeah, like it. But it, it, I'm totally out of my element. And also I haven't done much of the I've only skimmed part of the reading for today. So uh I'm uh, I'm I'm officially the one with the what, what do you call it the uh did you guys have that in in Ireland uh back in the like 30s or 40s when when someone in class was was uh uh behaving Don't, badly they got like a cone dunce cap yeah. dunce cap dunce cap. Yeah, dunce cap yeah 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 I'm the one with the dunce cap today <laughs> what do you call it? I was I was thinking, Emmanuel, maybe I could output the the book in binary for you to make it easier. Well, <laughs> putting hexadecimal, I I feel it's a lot more intuitive for me and my Android brain. <laughs> okay, well, uh, this is actually true, but Protocol a friend of mine who is only only speak in hexadecimal. <laughs> like her, it's her first language. <laughs> a, a friend of mine who is my age and was brought up about 10 miles down the road from me when she was in primary school the teacher actually made her wear a dunce cap wow shit you know wow huh. that's nine mid 80s ireland did you wow. know that yeah. they used dunce caps in the chinese revolution <laughs> or in the in the cultural revolution i should say huh. I well i think i had did see stuff about that yeah struggle session wow okay well, let's move yeah. on Derek, all the way from sunny, warm in Utah. Utah, how's it going? That's okay. Um, I guess you're proving that negging is how the Irish save civilization, but... Um... <laughs> I don't even know. What, what is this negging? <laughs> ne you don't want to know, man. Let's just, let's just go. <laughs> that, would imply, that would imply I'm trying to chat you all up. Am I right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Things are right. I think I must be pretty desperate now. Move, moving on, <laughs> Google Hangout chatting uh, from thousands of miles away. That's that's how I'll score. Now, <laughs> moving on, Alexa, how's it going? Going all right, Tom. It's a uh, it's a cold fucking day in Connecticut, and I'm not going outside for shit. Let's talk Marxism. Cool. And finally, we have Ian Jabo. Ian, do you say it with a j or a, just a, a Zabo? What, what way do you say it? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I, I personally pronounce it uh, Zabo, but supposedly I've heard it's like a sharp Z, um, if you're going to say it in like correct Hungarian. Like is, a yeah, Zabo. I, I was going to say, isn't it, isn't, it, uh, isn't it Hungarian? Yeah, it's Hungarian for the word tailor. Oh yeah, oh yeah, so 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 in Hungarian, I think it would be pronounced Sabo because I I know a few Sabo. Yeah, and yeah, it's I right. and a lot. just to remove the Z so that people think I'm Japanese. Sabo. <laughs> yeah. Sabo. I, I have more. Had, um, I've had a teacher. I had a teacher in high school who thought I was Japanese because of my oh. last name. <laughs> That's interesting. So, so it's it's a uh, Sabo like in, like in the verb saboru. Um, stop showing is, off. All right, stop. I, I'm, I'm gonna shut up. Whatever, <laughs> European. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna show off like the great uh, Romanian 5,000 meter runner Jabo, the world champion. Oh, yes, cool, everybody. The blonde head. Oh, okay. yeah, right. Anyway, what's most important <laughs> is how you say it in mayonnaise English. So, you say it, Sabo. <laughs> Zabo. Yes. <laughs> I, I All right. It's Zabo, but it's whatever. Ian Zabo, I like, everybody. Uh, I, I just like to bring people onto the show so then we can analyze how they say their own name incorrectly. That's, <laughs> that's what I like to do. Right. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, obviously, I'm joking. Ian, don't take me seriously. <laughs> don't take anything oh, I, don't I ever say it. seriously. 
I think a Hungarian name pretty much like cursed me to have my name pronounced incorrectly for my entire life. So it's whatever. A Hungarian name. I still cringe they, when I hear people pronounce Lukash incorrectly. Oh, it's yeah. not hard. Lukax. <laughs> you yeah. mean Luke's? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know what you got for present, Luke. No. See, okay. The only time I'll... <laughs> That's my favorite Star Trek joke. You know, our Star Wars joke. You know the one. I know what you got for present. I know what you got for Christmas, Luke. I felt your presence. I mean, you know that joke. <laughs> Great oh <one>. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Today we're going to start. Before we we have a section here that I've shared on the screen called "Before We Move On." This contains some elements from the first. Uh, introductory chapter, which we didn't really get into. Uh, and I think Lexi and, well, mm -hmm. probably me too, and some other people think that it's there are really important points about what uh, McNair thinks are the implications of what happened in the 20th century. So maybe we'll hand it over to Lexi. And may Lexi, you have a go at describing and um, reading or whatever you want to do. Okay. So uh, because in the United States we're having this conversation in the wake of the Marxist Center um, organization, um, there's a sort of de facto kind of look. We need to put all of our political differences aside and just see who wants to organize. I'm kind of sympathetic to that. I, I can see where people would want to take that uh, line and just try to cast off all this superstructural, ideological garbage and whatever and just you know focus on the real practical tasks. However, if you are taking McNair as your guide, um, you cannot entirely do that. And that's because of the causal role that McNair um, gives to the experience of Stalinism and the fear that contemporary communists are attempting another Russian revolution. And without acknowledging this, I find it hard to... I find it hard to, I don't know, uh, organize around McNair's principles, let's say. And not that Marxist center is doing so. They're using center in a, a way that's more associated right. with uh, the scholar Hal Draper. <clears throat> but as we go on with the book, I think it'll be obvious why something called Marxist center is relevant to McNair people. So I selected four quotes. I don't know how deeply we want to dig into each of them. I don't know if we want to do it Kleiman style and just read it out. I read um, it out. Read I it out. I think we should. <clears throat> Let me highlight the first one for you then. Sure. <clears throat> the short explanation of this situation is that the radical left, excuse me, that the political left is still in the shadow of the bureaucratic quote, socialist regimes of the 20th century and their fall, or in the case of China and Vietnam, their evolution towards openly capitalist regimes. It is not merely that these regimes were murderously tyrannical. The point is that all of the sacrifices, both of political liberty and of material well-being, which the regimes demanded of those they ruled, have only led back to capitalism. As long as the left appears to be proposing to repeat this disastrous experience, we can expect mass hostility to liberal capitalism to be expressed mainly in the form of rightism, that is, of nostalgia for the pre-capitalist social order. Um, so I that's... that's um, I think that's a, a great quote. You know, right. to me, it's yeah. like, um, I have great difficulty with when I meet uh, a lot of these small groups, you know, when I was in Occupy and I met like first interactions with a lot of the kind of SWP types or, you know, these these groups. And I don't know, like they have, they seem to be obsessed with Lenin and obsessed with the Russian revolution and all of this stuff. And to the, to the, to the average Joe on the street, they consider that whether they're informed or not, like a, a kind of a, like a, 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 they kind of consider that just like, why the hell would you be in favor of that stuff? Look what it led to. And, uh, you know, you, if you're going to be serious politically, you're going to have to deal with that point. Just no way around it. Yeah. And in the, in the context of the United States, there's a thought that goes like this. Because of the history of the Cold War, 
and the way that it stapled anti-communism into American life. Therefore, we have to push back against these, these uh, anti-Stalinist narratives because they've exaggerated things too much. And I think from the perspective of the glorious communist future, when people look back, you know, once we're already in communism and they look back at Stalinism, they can say, wow, what a sad attempt to do something good. Until we're in the glorious communist future, I don't see a point in trying to rehabilitate that. Speaking yeah, of. Yeah. Also, you know, see like Soviet anime leftist memes. Like, <laughs> it seems to me that most of the lefts, even even the, the, the quote, like the, the left with which like I identify seems to be a uh, like very Soviet apologist in a way that I think is usually I just think it's funny, but like this reminded me why that is probably not a good strategy if we want, you know, people who aren't only on very weird parts of the internet to join our cause. <laughs> Um, I want to uh, introduce a, a Donald. Donald is here. Um, hello. Hey, I, I can't really stay on for too long, but uh, I'm here. Well, I just, before we go, I just have to apologize for Donald for being such a troll in our in our um, in our in our Discord group that uh, he thought I was seriously kicking him off the reading group. Donald, I apologize for being such a trolly bastard. Oh, that's fine. You're uh, you're <laughs> Irish. It's in your blood. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> God right, damn just right. kidding just kidding no nasbol no nasbol <laughs> um donald i was attempting my be my best um my 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 best like uh you know stalinism is important and pushing back on anti-stalinism is important kind of position but i can't really give it in good faith like you can so d d d i'm sure you can read this quote that's up on the board do you have a response to this we just read out Um, the one that's highlighted. Yeah, that basically yeah. as long as... as that, well, yeah, I mean, we have to make it clear that we don't want Stalinist Russia. Like, I don't think any revolution in the 21st century is going to, like, look like Russia 1917 and then Stalin. I just think that, like, there's a certain narrative in the U.S. that's really... Uh, that just kind of... um. I, I, it's just it mirrors too much this kind of Asiatic despotism type narrative that I've heard before. But I don't know. My thoughts on this are pretty complex because I don't know. There's things about the Soviet Union that I will defend, but there's things I will pretty harshly critique. Yeah, like, uh, but in but in the context of American political strategy, we want a Marxist party to win in America, or to at least you know come together in the United States or in the American continent, let's say like, um, well, you know, I think the more relevant thing would be Cuba than if we're trying to like deal with, like what would that party's relationship with Cuba be like? Cause you know, they're pretty much, you know, it's a actually existing socialist state, like right off the shore. And I think, you know, it's, I, I think that, the, you know, the society that exists in Cuba is a little bit more complex than just, you know, Stalinism. Like, I think they've kind of moved away from that heavy Stalinist direction, unlike North Korea, which has kind of gone the opposite direction. Well, much like the Soviet Union itself, you know, there's a high Stalinist watermark and then there's, you know, the um, Khrushchev period. And from then on, it's kind of a different beast, even if it's still a beast. Yeah, I, was about to say, I would actually say, I don't know that, I know that you can't say that it wasn't Stalinist, but the, the, the extent of Stalin's influence on Cuba beyond, you know, Khrushchevian missile defense, which is already in the revisionist period, is kind of hard to exactly pin down as what could because because having studied for example like co-op patterns and stuff like that and like relative and like relative freedoms they follow a very different trajectory and it's not that cuba's perfect cuba's done some some stuff i would never do but it's it's still like it it you don't have you don't you don't have an equivalent to like the purges the purges yeah exactly that's what i'm saying i was like we got to like we should look at 
like the things that these countries did, like things we don't like about them and critique them and see why they happened. Great purges. I've been studying them a lot. And it's honestly, the more I study them, the more it's the harder it gets for me to kind of explain them in like economic determinist sense, if that makes sense. But, well, yeah. But, but, I think, uh, so, but so, anyway, so quick um let's sorry before we, we let's do the stack we've got so many people on the call now we're going to initiate stack from here on in who wants to get sorry. in there on donald first it was ian i think ian went to talk yeah. first manual so let's let ian and then emmanuel okay yeah i was just going to point out a, the sort of like i think still still valid in some sense is a somewhat soviet defense disposition especially in relation to somewhere like cuba or uh, North Vietnam, or possibly even Canada, which would be sort of, the, I, I think, the point that E.H. Carr um, tends to make, or tended to make, uh, which is that in the world historical sense, they are, you know, these these kind of, even if they are Stalinist uh, state formations, they are progressive. Um, but at the same time, the ones that have been defeated, especially, of course, as McNair points out, um, the big one, the big one that was defeated in 1989, the USSR, that becomes kind of pointless to continue defending it. It's simply, in, in the aftermath, what you have to do is instead analyze it. Yeah, like, Ian, I think... Ian, 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 could, sorry. sorry, Ian, your volume is really, really, it's really tinny and kind of coming in and out. Do you yeah, want to just I didn't give it a get quick, any of that. Um, can you want to give it a bit of a test? Again. All right, am I back? Yeah, yep. that's it. Do you want to say all that bit again with that with that button because the last one was nearly unusable? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was gonna. I was trying to kind of point out a sort of fusion of the views of uh, Trotsky and E. H. Carr, which is that I think that the Soviet Union and especially nowadays North Vietnam and Cuba are defensible as progressive in the world historical sense. Um, Whereas a place like the USSR and possibly even uh, North Korea, don't they don't really require that sort of defense that I think would be more necessary for a place that is kind of progressive and require instead a sort of more thorough analysis for understanding exactly what went wrong and why. Emmanuel, over to you. Emmanuel. You're next. <clears throat> yeah. So I. My question is is more to the to the panel, um, uh, because you've read this a lot more closely than I have. It, is is this book specifically about strategy in the United States? Because uh, no, I, I, I no. Got the impression from no, it's from not at all. It's, it's general, it's, no, but, general, yeah, general lessons for Marxist strategy. It, yeah, but it, it, in particular, but, but, like the actual context he's working in is the United Kingdom. And when I when I've ah, corresponded with right. him in private, he says, "No, I don't know anything about the United States. I know absolutely nothing about it," which I don't think is totally true. But that's what he right, says. Right? Okay. Okay. I I was just uh sort of reacting to the um, to the specific question of of uh, Marxist strategy in in the U.S. But, but okay. So so I'm that's self obsessed, because, Emmanuel. Um. <laughs> Um, because some of some of the things that I think we we might be getting at, at are things that I recognize a lot from um, Swedish political history, uh, and uh, it it didn't work for um, different reasons. But maybe we'll get to that. But just okay. So 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 then I know it's it's not a it's not about the U.S. specifically. Yeah. No. If anything, it's about the U.K. All right, okay. And even more so, it's uh, about a, it's a kind of very sharp critique, mainly of um, British Trotskyism. Okay, Emmanuel, did you have any other point to make before I hop in? Nope. Okay. Yeah, like one thing that I um, one thing that I feel about this is that like we need to be able to have a theory or some idea of structures that will hey, somebody is. Making some noise there, Derek. Let me mute you. What, one thing is that we need to have, you know, if we're thinking like strategically about how you create a party and what you want your party to sound like, look like, what it wants it to smell like, you cannot have it smelling like Stalinism. 
you can't let it smell and be situated in a way that feels like an old Stalinist party or a trot party. Just it won't work. It will get absolutely nowhere because people have the, the working people, the normal people that have a negative experience of that. And, you know, you know, we can't deny the massive problems that was that happened with those type of regimes. You know, like I live in London here. You've got lots of Eastern European people that have moved over since the since they joined European Union. And, you know, the vast major, like the vast majority that I have talked to have negative feel. I don't know the vast majority, but I would say the majority have very negative feel towards communism after coming out of it. Uh, some don't, but a lot of them do. And we could, that's something that we've got to be able to think about and strategize and design our political structures such that we can make a case for how we are different and how we're not going to go that way. And I think that has to be a major element of it. And while I love the kitsch of uh, Cosmonaut magazine, uh, politically, I don't think it's it's the wisest pitch to do a retro to a, a Soviet era thing, even though the graphics look cool. And, you know, I have my own Soviet posters. I just don't think politically it makes that much sense. But um, that's me. Well, I mean, to be honest, one of the benefits of using old Soviet kitsch is that there's no copyright on it. So you can just steal all their art as much as you want. And like, I don't know, I, I've always had a special place in my heart for the Soviet Union because they were the first to go in space. And I'm actually like working on an article right now about how the kind of utopian spirit of 1917 linked in with the Soviet space program. So anyway, I'm not I'll, sure. um, that's all I got to say for that. I got to I got to go do an errand, actually, but I'll be back. OK, all right, Derek's on stack. I actually kind of. Um... Sorry, Ian, kind of, Derek's oh, next. Yeah, sorry, Ian, Derek. That, you don't stack. sound a lot like Derek. Are you Derek? <laughs> sorry, you didn't hear it. All right. Um, Ian, what was your, uh, real quickly, what was your point on? Because I'm actually going to move ahead. So if you actually have a direct relevant point, I don't have a problem when you go in. Oh, it's not, it's, it was only tangentially related. Okay. I had uh, a point. I had a point that was related. Let me see if I can remember what it was. Um, no, no, it's gone. I have to bring it back. Um, okay. All right. Um, so one of the things that one of the elephants in the room for me in this quote that we we seem to have a particular hang up about the USSR, um, and maybe the defense of North Vietnam, um, which look I actually have defended the, <laughs> the North Viet Vietnam on Tom's show, so obviously I'm not totally uh, against it. Um, I I do, however. I do feel interestingly um, uh, about the 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 question of China, and because this is relevant right now, and it is a state, and there has been a resurgence in people claiming um, that China is not a capitalist state um, for a variety of uh, of reasons. Um, on the far left, on on the center, and on the right, um, and that to me is actually a bigger issue for trying to deal with a party because one of the things historically that is not being mentioned, but that the communist parties in in the United States and the UK, etc., they got funding from outside states, all right. Um, that was part of their tactical alignment. And, uh, you know, McNair's point in the first chapter, partly why he uses the first international as a model, is that we don't live in that world. We live in a world closer to, uh, um, uh, geopolitically, to like 1880, uh, to 19, like 1880, like 1914, than we do to, to the Cold War. But a, a, a party or mass movement even would have to deal with the actually still existing claim on socialism being made by China. And um, 
I, I'm not sure how the people here feel about that. I know that I, I have a hard time actually saying that China is out and out capitalistic. I mean, it, it would be hard to argue, for example, that it has private ownership and most theories of state capitalism fall apart but it's also I'm, I'm not going to argue remotely that it's socialism it doesn't even consistently have socialized medicine so like um it's just a form of a mixed economy derek isn't it yeah I'm, well, but it's a it's even weird for that actually but yeah i mean but you, there are marxists who deny them there are plenty of marxists actually deny the idea of a mixed economy as being even possible so it's uh it's I don't know. I, I don't want to get us bogged down in the debate on China, but it does seem like that that's going to be a hang up for a lot of people off the bat. In a way that, say, Cuba, for example, in, in we can get hung up on that too, but Cuba's not. Cuba's not a hang up. Okay, Ian? Oh, yeah, nothing to add. Uh, your mic's a little tinny, bud, but uh, all right. Uh, all right, so now um, where are we? So I had a couple things to say here, and then I think we should probably move on. Um, so I okay. Do you want to so have a look the, at these next points and read these paragraphs, Lexi? Uh, yeah, or, I just wanted to say I want to say one more thing though, if that's all right. Just um, ultimately, in the scope of Hegelian world history, maybe these states are vindicable. You know what I mean? But um, for the case of working class emancipation, I feel like the gut reaction to ooh, that was brutal probably more correct than any nuanced defense. Um, the plight of the Uyghurs in China right now, for instance, that's being, uh, it's being documented really well in uh, Shuang, the communizer sort of Chinese journal. Um, I, I think that any future Marxism basically will have to be thought through and organized on the basis of that pit in our stomach that this kind of came out fucked up and we probably shouldn't appeal to it. Um, let's move on. A core to that is actually just to sort of um, just actually, if we're going to yeah. at the very least be, yeah. just be completely honest about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think a, a narrative attachment to these regimes makes it difficult to be honest about it. Same here. And if, if we take like the, the core of socialism, like that Marx would say, is the workers control the means of production, none of them have that. And that's fundamental, you know, and none of them have it. So it's hard to defend anybody that doesn't have that. So um, to, to, to pick up on that a little bit on, on the Uyghur question and some other things, um, it has been interesting to me because this came up last week too, how a lot of this has met with two quokes. Um, you know, oh, yeah. The, the U.S. does it too, or why aren't you just focusing on all the horrible things the U.S. does? Or, um, uh, and I both understand that logic. You know, Tr uh, Chomsky does that. Um, but also I worry about it because Ch Chomsky's got egg on his face for doing that, for example. He, he sort of was a little soft on Pol Pot. Um, okay. <laughs> um and has been called on it by not yes by right wing scholars, but also there's some left wing scholars who's called him on it. Um, Zizek. Yeah, Zizek. Uh, there's a there's a um, a Cambodian specialist uh, who who was sympathetic to to Marxism. Who also I can't remember his name, but I, I remember finding the long article on all the mistakes made. But um, so I also don't think. I, when I, if you pull that, it might work with leftists and people who who are disenfranchised. But I can't imagine that working on pretty much anybody else because because the also the argument is kind of ridiculous because you're like, well, we want to fight the U.S.'s crimes, so we're going to forgive someone else's crimes because they're maybe not as bad. Like that's that's a special kind of weird, um, but. I've seen that. Um, I, I've seen that explicitly lately, um, and it, it's it's been weird because I've also seen alt rightists do it. So it's been this this strange, like almost horseshoe sheery thing. Um, and I'm gonna shut up about it. But it, it that that uh, I want to nip that in the butt because we, we we kind of talked about this last week, and I I don't think McNair would have a lot of patience for that 
too far. Like you might have a nuanced position, but there'd be a limit to it. Yeah, it comes up later in the book, actually. So, um, in a, in a kind of veiled form about uh, defeatism, but we should move on. Um, under the, all right, so I'm gonna read another quote. That was from page 10, this is from page 11. Under the Soviet style bureaucratic regimes, there is no objective tendency towards independent self-organization of the working class, rather there are episodic explosions. But to the extent that the bureaucracy did not succeed in putting a political cap on these, they tended towards a pro-capitalist development. The strategic line of a worker revolution against the bureaucracy, whether it was, whether it was called, quote, political revolution, as it was by Orthodox Trotsky, Trotskyists, or quote, social revolution by state capitalism and bureaucratic collectivism theorists lacked a material basis. So what's he getting at here, Lexi? Well, first he's skewering virtually every analysis of the Soviet Union in the 20th century, other than the most pessimistic. The most pessimistic that was done by some of the heterodox Trotskyists and I think Bordiga, even though he thought it was capitalism, also at least had the sense that the Soviet Union was actually a regime towards capitalism as well, which I, that's just undoubtedly true. For, for, well, the extension of those like, oh shit, this is just gonna you know, get fed into capitalism theories. Um, virtually every line on the Soviet Union that Marxists tried to take that was at all appealing to the specter of working class, social or political revolution is completely wrong because the working class doesn't actually organize in a worker state. They're they're done. They're like they they are actually frozen and locked out in a way that McNair thinks doesn't happen in capitalism. That's a fair point, isn't it? Like there isn't like a dynamic towards being organized in a very repressive commu like existing communist state because they would essentially be under the thumb of the, whether it's a KGB or whatever, the secret police a lot, you know, it's a lot more repressive there than it would be to organize here in most. I know China has got a lot of organizing, but that's certainly not something we ever heard of as a feature of, say, the Soviet Union or the Eastern Bloc, apart from solidarity. No, anything that's uh, evidence for capitalism in China. Yeah, it's actually, that's interesting to think about. Um, one of the interesting things about this is uh the uh, state capitalist here i know Le lexi you seem to said that the, the the towards capitalism that's important because state capitalist theories um uh, they posited a social revolution and for those who don't speak really arcane <laughs> trot um th there's a di the difference there is that a social revolution is an like it's basically uh an entire you know, a social revolution is like what, uh, what's a good parallel with French revolution? Well, yeah, actually the language I think comes out of the French revolution where the social right. revolutionaries wanted to reorganize society. The political revolutionaries just wanted to change regimes. Right. And the political revolution is just a regime change. Like it's, a, and so, um, the, these debates are interesting. What's also interesting is, is actually McNair name drops the two tendencies he thought were were the most right and what's they're not states capitalist tendencies so that's interesting too i mean he actually says the the least wrong were the sparts and the uh and the marcy the neo marcyites in the uk in specific and um those are deviations of orthodox trotskyist positions about bureaucratic um not bureaucratic collectivism um deformed worker statism and the, what makes them what made them correct was that they were most pessimistic but he even points out they were also wrong like nobody called <laughs> not a single trot group called 1990 1988 to 1992 not one because it because no one thought uh opposition you know from from a movement towards capitalism and trot world was possible. Yeah, that and I think it's also, there's also just like what his actual position is, which he's said in um, lectures, um, which you can find on, I think like Vimeo, 
for some reason, um, is that the USSR was neither state capitalist or bureaucratic collectivist, although he seems to sort of agree with Hillel Tickton's version of bureaucratic collectivism. But he tends to he tends to say that what it really was at the end of the day, because I think it becomes unambiguous uh, by 89, uh, is that it was a long detour to capitalism, and that a lot of these regimes at the end of the day were long detours into capitalism. And I think he, he's probably drawing that also off of he's probably drawing that also off of uh, the world systems theorists, which he tends to quietly draw quite a lot, um, which mm. is that that these were all that a lot of these were transitions, um, not necessarily to socialism, but to modernity. That, there, that at the end of the day, Leninism became a different path to modernity itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely a, a big influence as well as uh, G. A. Cohen's like theory of history. But um, I think we should move on. There's old man Wallerstein all over McNair's work. If you if you can like read through the lines. Yeah, the same with the analytical Marxists. They're all over this, and in the same way, he's not loud about it. He doesn't want to associate himself with it. So, um, moving onwards, unless anyone else has something to say. Um, okay. Trotskyists of all varieties continue to put forward as positive socialist strategy, a revolution in the image of 1917 in Russia. But as everyone knows, what happened to the Russian revolution was the emergence of the bureaucratic regime, which is now ended or is in the process of ending in capitalism. Trotskyists are therefore required to account for how the bureaucratic regime arose and to offer reasons for supposing that the process would not be duplicated anywhere else, which it had a 19 style, uh, excuse me, not be duplicated anywhere else, which had a 1917 style revolution from page 12. Um, we brief, we've covered this a little bit, but why would anyone want to do that again? I remember people asking me this when I was more Leninist sympathetic when I was, you know, hovering around a Trotskyist group, I'd be like, yeah, but it didn't work. Be like, yeah, but it almost worked. Yeah, but it didn't. But it, but it didn't though. <laughs> it, it's it's the key question. It's like it's the key it's the key comment. But it, it didn't work. You know, it's like the man in the street, the simplest logic. And you go, why would you do that again? Like he's fucking dead, right? You know, unless you can strategically and understand what went wrong and what not to do the next time it's pointless you might as well just go drinking yeah i've actually it, there's been a, a return to a post hoc logic that we that 1917 works we can see the proof in the pudding because 1917 happened um and i don't think anyone um on this uh podcast regardless of how they feel about the soviet union whether or not they're defenseless or not would actually really argue for that but when when we are arguing with each other we often make that argument like well it worked and yeah it 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 it, it worked like okay if it worked then also for example quote Ancient, uh, the Athenian Empire worked because it's the only society that I can think of that was as short-lived as the Soviet Union. So, you know, that's what we're dealing with. Like, I have one historical parallel. I have to go back 2,400 years-ish for it. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, oh! I was gonna ask what what revolution you were thinking of. Oh, the 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 what well, the transition to the Athenian Empire because that society lasted for about seventy years. So oh, the, that that makes a lot more sense then. Yeah, it's not a single revolution. It's it's it's. I mean, there was kind of a it was a political revolution, but the transition of like um, citizen democracy, a hyper minoritarian democracy in ancient in an ancient city state, that is a society that lasted the same length as the result of the Russian revolution, which is not to, de which is not actually, I don't even say that to demean, you know, the, the USSR it did, it actually did a whole lot in the, in like, 
in its time period, but it's also oh, it only lasted a human lifetime. In the scale of world societies, that's that's not. I mean, there's not a whole lot else that's that short that was also that successful, um, and has that and has had world historic importance. Um, just just want to move on, like one moment, because I think we're all kind of agreeing on, like, yeah, you can't make the post hoc argument. But why do you think the temptation to continue to make that is? I mean, what? Um, because that's a question I think about. Because it's a, it's an argument that I've seen since I was 18 years old, and you know, in first exposed left book stuff in like 1997. Wh and and then like the sting was super fresh. Like, like, you know, like I remember when the wall fell. Uh, so <laughs> I don't think it's any more complicated than something bad that exists. It, it can be better than something good that doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, you have a material basis to draw on, but I wanted to mention just in relation to like the kind of Trotskyist narratives about um, the revolution is that, um, sorry, I keep seeing myself not being particularly loud, um, but a kind of like really core misapprehension that shows up over and over again when it comes to the Trotskyist narratives is that they completely ignore who actually set up the Soviets. It was not. It was not the Bolsheviks. It was not Trotsky. It was it was the Mensheviks, and it was the same way in Germany. It was the reformist Social Democrats. Almost invariably, you had massive um, reformist factions building up uh, trade unions and workers' councils beforehand, and so the, which is kind of like a perfect a perfect kind of place to center on, where it's sort of like you have this mythology, but it's it's predicated on huge misapprehensions about what the basis for that revolution itself was. Indeed. Are we ready to move on to the last quote and then we can actually, uh, you know, talk about chapter one. What do you say people? All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, okay, great. Cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> probably most people who come into contact with the organized left don't think, don't think about the issue at this level of analysis, i.e. that the left has failed to account properly for Stalinism. What they see is something much simpler, that the left groups are massively divided. And if they are familiar with the groups or pass through membership of them, that the groups are not really democratic, but either no more democratic than the capitalist parliamentary constitutional regime, or that they are characterized by bureaucratic tyranny, just like Stalinism. In reality, the division is to a considerable extent, the product of bureaucratic collectivism, I'm sorry, the product of bureaucratic centralism, and both are at least in part produced by the failure to account properly for Stalinism. So why does this matter? And this is why it matters. This has something of an impact on our political life that you'd have to be ideologically motivated not to see. Um, we're either just about as bullshit democratic as the United States Congress, or we're even worse. Why should anybody trust us if we're like that? someone who's experienced grievance procedures less democratic than the American justice system, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, like it, it just, it's just so obvious to, to the man on the street that would say they would be interested in something, but what about Stalin? It's just, these are just obvious truths that the, to, for me, while people may talk about them on the left, people who may talk the talk but when you actually get into actually dealing with them and dealing in their organizations, they don't act like that in the slightest. That's my experience of any of these left wing oh, yeah. groups. And it's my experience of friends of mine who got into, say, the Irish version of SWP, just like I didn't know he was in it and he tried it and he said, you know, they were just so intense and they were weird and he left after a while because they wrecked his head. I think that's probably par for the course for the vast majority of people who pass through all these kind of left groups. There's, 
There's something unspoken actually about that too that I kind of want to talk about because there's a, a way with left groups are democratic in the way they set things up, but the like five or six we people who set it up set up everything, and then as people accrue in the organization, um, it becomes much harder to democratically do anything. So you have a tyranny of those who are there first. Um, and I don't really know how to fix that exactly. I mean, that's not like that doesn't happen in states too, but it, it's just, it's an interesting issue. Um, and there's also a tendency and the McNair doesn't talk about this. this is actually some, some nuts and bolts stuff I wish got brought up in this book, but there's also a tendency in these, in these uh, pro democratic uh, groups to believe in stuff like um, no secret ballots and stuff like that. So that, uh, so that you can quote own the responsibility of your voting unquote, which is a way to have soft power pressure applied to people to stay mm -hmm. in line. And anyone who studies psychology knows this, and that's why secret ballot is used so much. But th it is very popular for leftists to argue that secret ballot is uh, tyrannical for some reason. So, um, that privacy is bourgeois, Derek. Right. Um. And a lot of these groups, um, in fact, I would say almost all of them, Trot, Mao, actually, weirdly, but some of the Maoist groups are actually better um, about this stuff. Um, I know it's sad, but it's true. Um, th they all have these, these uh, constitutions that are largely pulled from the Bolsheviks in 1921. And like they're, they use these, like, no secret ballots, all public voting. Um, uh uh factionalism's banned um uh you vote slate for representatives not individuals um etc and so forth and and they tend to produce the same things over and over and over again which is these these little sectarian movements um so yeah, I, I so I do think in some sense, like at least on a formal structural level, like maybe you can't pull a whole lot from the Bolshevik model. Um, I mean, honestly, maybe maybe earlier bourgeois models are better. Mm. Yeah, I I don't know, Derek, if you remember on KMO's show, he used to have this magic guy on who was like one of these collapse guys on called john michael greer do you remember him yeah uh I, yes i I'm, I'm actually kind of a fan of john michael greer but he's kind of a weird collapsarian druid literally a druid yeah a collapsarian <laughs> druid it sounds like a weird religion but he, he um but he was like saying at the time when occupy came up and he talks a lot of rubbish and he talks some sense too. But he, he said um, that like it was obviously a very crappy organizational structure. He was saying, you know, you could just, when he was involved in stuff in the 60s, you could have like straight down the line, two thirds majority on certain things that were contentious. And he just laid out some simple like rules and organize them and you know he was absolutely spot on dead right i think that when you see all of those things you're talking about there Derek, when people are talking about you know these uh, having a slate and having you know uh, no secret ballots i think when people are designing these they know exactly what they will lead to and most important for these people who set up a small set and uh, they, they really want is to remain in control the idea that you can start a group and then it'll grow to like 100,000 members and you and your four mates will still be the leading people in it. Idiotic way to do it. The, the sign that you are growing should be a sign of positivity and that you will attract good people into it. But I don't think these organizations are ever set up like that. They're set up to maintain high control, you know, and usually jobs for the bureaucratic boys or jobs for the for the state uh, uh id um you know intellectual whether you're alex kalanikos or somebody from swp or 
pick your pick, you know pick your choice so like the structure of how we organize the structure of how you set up these groups is key and crucial to growth and success and that's one of the reasons why dsa took off is because of its structure how structureless it was for like control and stuff <laughs> you know and that's one of the reasons for its growth that like let's not let's let's not be uh I think it's it's it, why did the DSA grow above all these other ones? Any of these ones could have taken off, but it, it seems obvious to me it's a structural one. It's mainly because Bernie Sanders used the word democratic socialism. There was that, and because if you think democratic socialism and you want an org that's democratic socialism, you're probably not hostile to the Democratic Party, right? And democratic socialists of America basically only exists because of its, you know, uh, you know, it's a right socialist uh, strategy uh, that we'll we'll get into next week. What, but what are right we being fair? Mean? Are we being fair to the DSA for saying that? It's easy just to say, mm -hmm. oh, because Bernie said it. But like, what about all this this vast amount of young people who have like read Chomsky and come to stuff over the internet that are like would that would be. Would, that would have come to the organization from not just Bernie and uh, I, I might be, am I wrong? Obviously I'm not living in America, but I, I would be very surprised if everybody just heard Bernie saying democratic socialism went in. I'd be very surprised. I, I think, I don't think you are totally wrong, Tom, but I would say like, uh, full disclosure, some people in, in this group, although not me have been in the DSA, um, the structure mm -hmm. of the DSA is way more complicated and more problematic than I think you realize. It is great for growth, but it is terrible to do anything. Like, it pretty much... Granted, can't... granted, that's not the argument, though. Just talking about growth. and We're talking about why these groups are like that. You know? Well, but this that's just tied to the right... This What I mean by that, though, that's tied to the right, uh, the right Marxist nature of it. Because it can't it can't do anything on its own other than grow, which is great. It can grow. And and you're right. How it grows is like, I mean, it has bylaws that are actually, it's in some ways somewhat strict. They're just only selectively if ever invoked. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it's larger issue is that what it, all it can do net, all it can do, what it can do locally is the same thing. What an, uh, that any, I mean, frankly, any anarchist group can do and what it can do nationally is really only, only effective is is working an adjunct to another party um which which okay that's fine now that's that that's fine we need to understand the strength the strength is there's no strong ideological litmus test to joining it's it's uh and it can it also though it's uh, i i i think you know it, there are other there are hard geopolitical limits to that and i also think that we have to remember that while it's mass fifty-five thousand, while way better than anything that has existed in the u.s except for the sds the students for a democratic society um which was not an explicitly marxist organization um for the left it's still on the scale of of this of the u.s pretty tiny and i'll shut up and we can move on Oh, I, I was just going to point out um, the the DSA's membership is kind of the equivalent of um, have you seen those muscle builders who inject saline into their um, into their arms? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Insofar as they uh, essentially, all you have to do is pay twenty dollars on their website. I'm sorry, fifty thousand members is is kind of like the biggest overstatement on the planet. And the Green Party in the U.S also has 300,000 members on paper. So I, I'm i sorry, I can't usually believe those numbers. Yeah, the, it, it is like being um, in the LDS church. It's almost impossible to get yourself removed from the rolls too. So it, that takes no account of bone out people who aren't in an active chapter. I think people who've even been purged are still technically on the rolls. So it doesn't, it, it's hard to know how meaningful any of that is. Yeah, it was when I was in it, um, maybe six or seven years ago, and I was still in it like way longer than I stopped. Like I stopped paying dues and everything, and I was definitely 
in the loop for longer than I probably should have been. Fair enough. But let's say, for example, compare that to, say, the CPGB in Britain. Yeah. Like, it's... No, no, no. There's no comparison. They, look, no they comparison. Got like, if you, yeah, but if you think about their structure, the CPGB, they have your invite only, I think. And they're oh, trying to right, get... Right. They're trying to get people from other sects, you know. You know wh what is the logic of la like, you know, considering Mike Minear comes out of it, it's just so bizarre that this book is written by him compared yeah, to that, like organization that he's in. We we had we 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 we've mentioned before, but Lexi and I were both in a party that adopted the CPGB's uh, constitution and just vaguely like changed a couple of things. Um. And um, we had the same problem. Like it, it, w it was hard to become a member. What membership entitled you to was weird. It was the, the internal democracy structure was quite was there. It existed, but it was quite strange. Um, uh, paper members versus real members were a real problem. Um, and I, yeah, that. That's fascinating to me, but I, th I, I think, you know, what, what McNair would say is the CPGB isn't a party. It's what it really is, is a, is like a, huh? Think tank. The, the phrase, the word, the, the description he uses is ginger group. What does that mean for people who don't speak McNair? I don't know. It's a McNairism. What did he call us? Sorry, say a again. Ginger group. I, I don't know. No McNair idea. has his own. McNair has his own lexicon that he uses. Well, okay, like a, a ginger group. That sounds like some kind of colloquial expression. I think the the what <clears throat> what he ends up. <clears throat> pardon me. What he ends up arguing for in the book later on is a sort of abstraction from the shitty parts of the 21 theses in 1921 that establish like Leninism proper, um, the Bolshevization wave. Um, he, he abstracts the party of activists, quote unquote, from that, as opposed to a mass party. And I think maybe that's what he means by a ginger group. That's my best guess. Nope. Well, I think right. then what is it? By looking I'd... it up on Google. <laughs> I, I, I just actually did look it up. So um, I looked up on Wikipedia. It is a formal or informal group within an organization that seeks to influence direction and activity of said group. It comes from the phrase ginger up. It's basically a caucus. Um, or So it's a caucus within what, labor? That's It's a caucus without a... I mean, well, the, originally the CPGB... P I C. I keep. I give it another. I get. I change it. It's P C C. P C C. All right. Provisional Central Committee. Yeah, that was the ginger group within the C P G B. But I think they pretty much got booted out of the C P G B because it was an uh, an M L organization. So um, there, there's a history there. So what it was attached to has changed over time. Um, I gone yep. okay so like like yeah so the original the original um you know communist party of great britain doesn't exist anymore you just have two two sectarian well one anyway, let's move on. and one sectarian split anyway move on let's talk about this are we yeah, done with this right. yet okay we made yeah. it to chapter one everybody congratulations We're chapter one just chapter to let one people know one. i'm yeah, I'm feeling like shit, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to survive a full show today. I'm kind of coming down with something. So um, what do we want to do? Let's let's have a go at start some of it, because we can just... Uh, um, I'm sorry to say that, but I am. Um, okay. Right, we all have this document that we put together, um, that we put together main things. I think we should go from the actual uh, text and kind of deal with the points in here. If people can have a look at the, the general points before we go, if there's anything that's missing from there, let me know. Um, let's start with the very first initial point, which I think is an important one, which I don't know if we actually talk, I think we did talk about it initially last week for a second, was this first paragraph, which seems to be lost on most uh, 
Marxists, I think, is that evolutionary, the essence of revolutionary strategy is this long-term character. It is the frame within which we think about how to achieve our goals over the course of a series of activities or struggles, each of which has its own tactics. Derek. Yes. Talk. All right, I will. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about this last last week, but it's, it's important to remember that that long-term character means it isn't just a tactical, and it definitely isn't an ideological orientation. Um, you have a strategic goal, which means we want to achieve this. I mean, which I guess the, the strategic goal is also an ideological goal, but the, it isn't merely a question of immediate tactics or like winning the next election or getting into parliament or any of that. The question is like, A, how do you, be, how do you have a, how do you build a mass movement to do X and B, how do you actually do X and see what happens after you do X? Those are all part of your, of, of your strategic orientation. Okay. Um, sorry. Just give me one sec. I'm just, Trying to go, Lexi. Do you want to do the? Well, we there's also some stuff in here about. Um, well, we did it last week as well as about how we how how we uh, are basically in the same period essentially as um, they were in the 1860s, 1870s when they set up the first international. One interesting thing he has in here is about the defeat. What's that? Well, oh, it's a bit of a it's a, it's a bit of a simplification. I, all, all I want to say is that we're in a period more like that than the classical like Marxist 1917 period, you know, through the Soviet Union's collapse. That's all. I I don't know about you guys, but I'm wearing a a bone a bone a uh, um a whale bone dress <laughs> as we're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm lighting my internet with ruining my my PC here on paraffin whale and whale oil. <laughs> no, I I know you're you're not saying that. I know, I know you're not saying it's exactly like it. But <laughs> there are people that on that basis, you know, will extrapolate maybe a lot more than you probably can. Um, anyway. Okay. Does anybody want to see uh, this, this paragraph here? This paragraph here, he he talks about eighteen to twenty one, saw the defeat. Of the concept of Bolshevism, that's a state. Yeah. That's quite a. It's quite a statement for a Leninist to say. Yeah, this is something I, I. I believe so. Go ahead. Say it then. Talk on it. All right. So, eighteen to twenty-one saw the defeat of the historic strategic concept of Bolshevism, meaning the the, the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, as well as those of Trotsky, workers' government as supported by the poor peasantry, and Luxembourg. Workers' movement, set free by revolutionary crisis, would solve its own problems. The concrete form of defeat was the Russian that Russia remained isolated, and but this has been my stance. And it's even somewhat like Chomsky actually even holds this stance. Interestingly, although for different reasons, reasons I don't think are as valid, um, that that Bolshevism could not get out of Russia. It, it it was not an effective strategy in Germany for whatever reason. And because of that, it effectively, um, it effectively became a histor it became a historical cul-de-sac. Um, and I, I actually, I remember reading a bunch of essays because I, I had this joke where I used to put like a, a list of random years in the 20th century up. They weren't random, but, and I would say, which year you pick as the, as the w betrayal of the revolution tells me what tendency you are. And, um, and so like, like many left communists do actually, and, and McNair is not a left communist, do not be confused, but he shares this similarity with a lot of them. He, he puts 1918 as the moment and he doesn't put it on Lenin. He puts it on the failure of, of Germany and also, you know, of, of basically the Russian revolution to be properly speaking a world revolution. Okay, let's read this next chapter. Sorry. Okay. Keep Go going. No, okay. I mean it's just it's just the fact that the, the revolution wasn't supposed to be a national revolution. Although to be also fair, Russia wasn't isn't a nation, it's an empire, but whatever. Okay, the next part the next paragraph he goes on to say something that is kind of the core of this book. What happened instead was to send was to tender 
con sorry was um sorry what happened next was to render concrete the 1850s warnings of Marx and Engels against the premature seizure of power in Germany, which formed the basis of Kautsky's caution in the 1890s and 1900s. By choosing to represent the peasantry and other petty proprietors, especially state bureaucrats, the Workers' Party disabled itself from representing the working class, but instead became a sort of collective Bonaparte. Okay. So this is a key point if we're thinking about setting up and thinking long-term strategy. It's like, if you look at, say, someone like Luxembourg with the with the uh, the Spartacus League, what percentage of the vote did they have at the time? Were they five or six percent? Around there. It was, it was small. And um, yeah. Yeah. And also, like, they weren't, to be fair, I, I was reading... Um, I was reading uh, an introduction to the Russian Revolution. I think it was one of one by Oxford, and it went down into like what what uh, group made up the the majority of the people. And like with the with the Spartacus League, most of its membership were un were uh, unemployed and um, and Catholic. I don't know why that's important, but it it just indicated that there was a, that it had a a micro niche character. Um, even in its demographic um, appeal, which is kind of interesting to think about. I'm not had I, I I may be over relying on you know quote bourgeois sociology here, but it I haven't actually got a good explanation for why that was the case. Um, so yeah, but it was small, and uh, the SP day was huge, but was already tending right. So. Um. Maybe we should zoom in on what he means by collective Bonaparte. Um, there is a tendency in Trotskyism, and I think it is actually based off of uh, the 18th Brumier, like one of Marx's yeah. works. It's uh, It goes back to classical Marxism, not just right. Trotsky. Yeah, yeah, well, it goes back to Marx. Like this concept of uh, Bonapartism, that um, usually the state, is basically representing the interests of the bourgeois class, but every so often in a historical aporia where there's a sort of like, you know, stalemate of sorts, the state can develop more relative autonomy than is normal and start pursuing its own interests, you might say. It might be said the interests of a certain strata or caste if you want to avoid making uh, bureaucrats a class. Um, but that's. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's what he's going with by by saying by choosing to represent the peasantry and other petty proprietors, especially state bureaucrats. The Workers Party disabled itself from representing the working class. So let's that's see, what he why, means. Why isn't why isn't a McNair an autonomist then? Because but I actually why is he I, not an autonomist? Yeah, because like that that actually is that reads like an autonomous point. I, it just occurred to me reading yeah. this again yesterday. Like that's. That's actually a pretty interesting point because it's not just that it's not just that the Bonapartism, by the way, we need to be we need to expand on that. Isn't just sure, sure. It, that it represents a bureaucratic class, it represents a coalition of small classes of which the um a bureaucratic class is dominant. Right, so right, right. like it the, the you know, the classic uh, and Marx is the lump and proles and parts of the peasantry and parts of the bureaucracy, you know. Mm -hmm. Um but in in other in other times it's been other it's been other groups. So he's saying by representing the peasantry, and then that's specific to Russian Bolshevism. Um, and then um, who else does he say? Uh, you petty proprietors, particularly state bureaucrats. Notice he doesn't even say uh, he doesn't say petite bourgeois because they're not even properly no. speaking bourgeois yet. Um, it's right. like the petty proprietors is like a, is a an abstraction from petty bourgeois, which I actually like. They have small property. It's not about being bourgeois. You know, they 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 might employ nobody. Right. There'd be tab like somebody open a baker, a tavern owner, or something small. Are we, or what are well, saying? Yeah, or also a street, street like, vendor. Yes, vegetable that, seller. Well, that's that's true, uh, petty bourgeois. But yes, he means them. But he also means uh, large land owning peasants. Um, uh, a lot of us in, in this conversation, 
Um, I, you well, know. yeah, like uh, intellectual, like rentier, rentiers, maybe, like <laughs> could be a p contemporary, like, you know, form well, of weird abstract petty proprietor. Well, like in Russia, for example, the intellectual was literally an employee, was like a patronized class by the aristocracy. Like it was a literal, it was a separate deal. And that was part of right. that, right? So it applies like, there even more than it does now in a way. Right. Did, did, did you say a Patreon class? Oh, I like it. I like it. That <laughs> <laughs> does describe our uh, relationship to the means of production. <laughs> um, I hate to read the entire book, but there's just a lot of really good chapters right around here on this stuff. Um, it's very dense and, you know, yeah, really good, good pickings. Go for it. Okay. Uh, well, like, yeah, he, he basically talks about how the Bolshevik leaders could feel it happened to themselves. And that they, you know, it, they still still happened. Let's just read it here. The Bolshevik leaders could see and feel it happening to themselves. Derek, uh, you need to mute yourself a bit. You're doing a bit of grunting. Derek's doing his squats as we speak. The Bolshevik <laughs> leaders could see and feel it happening to themselves. And in 1919 to 23, the common turn flailed around with a succession of short-lived concepts, each of which would, it would hope, break the isolation of the revolution. These strategic concepts are not simply rendered obsolete by the collapse of the USSR in 1991. The fate of other socialist countries also proves them to be a strategic blind alley. Okay, so he's making that broader point that it's not just Russia, it's all of the others have essentially fell into the same basic problem. Yeah, this doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah. This, this more generally in its Russian form, but also in its exported form. So it didn't work where it started, and then where it was exported, it also did not work. Um, yeah. So it fail failed in Russia, failed in China, failed in Vietnam, failed in Cuba, right. failed in Eastern Europe, failed right. in Central Asia. It's failed everywhere. Nowhere did it get towards what, would, what you would think of the people who ran those revolutions wanted them to turn out like. Yeah, yeah it and it's um modernity. Say again, Ian. I was gonna say it. It 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 goes back to the sort of world systems point, which is that these were not socialistic triumphs; but they are simply alternative passages into modernity. And, exactly. Um, what, exactly. What you're saying about the world systems thing is accentuated in a point of his called historical blind alleys, in which he makes um, analogs essentially for. The different sorts of society, like ancient society and you know feudal society, etc. Et you know, he makes um he makes like rough parallels where in one the predominance of one mode of production, a little island, an experiment will pop up and then fade away, and then later on it will be shown that that is actually an expression of a broader dynamic that would soon become the dominant mode of production. He uses the Venetian Republic. Um, as an example of, you know, the, the, a proto-capitalist republic, but but at its time a historical blind alley because it doesn't actually blossom from there, um, and so I guess that's how he ultimately sees Leninism or Stalinism, whatever. Is that it's a? I, I think you could fairly say Leninism, really. Uh, that Leninism, it, it just is one of these historical blind alleys from from the glorious socialist future future we'll see it as continuous in a sort of sense but in, in the practical sense it will not literally be a continuous struggle okay lexi why don't you read out this next paragraph i think this sums let's, it up quite well let's do it when you are radically lost it becomes necessary to retrace your steps in the present case this means retracing our steps to this to the strategic debates of the early workers' movement and the Second International, which defined the strategic choices available to socialists in the early 20th century, and in this sense, led to the blind alley of 1918 through 91. Um, you know, there's also, there's, there's often a question nowadays, you know, why do we study any of this? Um, what's the point? Um, some of the newer Marxists, the communizers, would go as far to say that there's nothing to be learned from the 20th century, nothing to be learned from their failures because we couldn't repeat them if we wanted to. But all millennial American Marxists 
for the most part, I mean, maybe there's a, a few diff different, you know, most of us aren't growing up as red diaper babies and inheriting this tradition. We've seen, you know, the rational progressive left turn into frothing uh, conspiracy theorists, you know. Um, we've, we've seen the breakdown of political legitimacy. Um, there's a lot of reasons that people would turn towards history and towards theory to understand. And I don't think you can really honestly do that much theory without history. You can do a, a, a good empirical read, you know, you can um, use some of the tools of contemporary like analysis to, you know, draw some suggested interpretations that are intuitively plausible. But I don't really think without appealing to the broader tendencies of history, even if we are in a very different time period, uh, that you can really make sense of any of this. Also, you this is literally why I'm a history major. <laughs> this, right. is, this is the book, this is the paragraph that made me become a history major. I'm not even joking. Oh, wow. Oh. Well, I think it's an it's an excellently succinct point, isn't it? And one thing I'd like to say about it is is I don't know, Lexi. I was just doing something there. I don't know if you've said this already, but it's it's like the thing is that when people really get into thinking about Derek, you're 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 grunting again. Let me mute you. Um, I don't so, mind it. <laughs> that's just because it turns you on, Ian. Now this. This, um, like the, the the fear that when somebody gets into trying to look at the history and trying to un, my 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 feeling is that an awful lot of times people end up kind of nearly becoming smitten with that time, and that we should learn from that time, but we should try everything in our power to move beyond it, and. I just feel with an awful lot of contemporary Marxists, there is this kind of longing for 1917 when we should be critical and we should always be thinking critically of it. And I think that this paragraph here puts it so well. It, it, for me, it just puts it so well what what we should be using history for. Um, and, you know, it's this, you know, this, this, this uh, kind of, we don't want to kind of fall into uh, history buffdom or kind of uh, 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 this longing for the past, like for people who want to go hunting wild boar. You know, there's always there is always an element of that. You know, I just something that always hit, strikes me when it when I when I meet like any uh, truck group types, and I always kind of turns me off to be honest a lot of the time. Not Honestly. Honest. Yeah, if we're gonna be antiquarians, I'd rather us be antiquarians about like hunting wild boar and you know wearing weird Bronze Age costumes or something than than just uh, like that seems like if you're gonna pick a weird myth, you could pick a better one. Like, uh, yeah, at least there's an age of glory. <laughs> I, I want to be running around my garden naked with a with a boar's antlers and its head hollowed out on top of mine. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I think like the there point you why you actually analyze history it, in the way that that McNair is calling for is not is never to kind of recapitulate these arguments or try to try to get try to get lost in that history, but sort of I think in a very broad way, kind of pull out exactly what did what did someone do right, what did someone do wrong, um, and I think. When it comes to something like analyzing, especially because he always points to the Second International, I I personally do as well. Um, the kind of the thing that you learn isn't, you know, the very particular aspects of the Second International that they did right, but what you can learn are things that we actually still are kind of um, are kind of still rediscovering. Um, I think a I think actually a really good example when it comes to um, the second, when it comes to the second international, that we're kind of more recently rediscovering in terms of sociology is is in uh, the theoretical framework called um, social reproduction theory, where they're just where they're kind of focusing on looking at um, organization at the site of social reproduction, 
And as an historian, you look, you can look back at the Second International, especially the German SPD, and you can find that they were that they were absolutely involved in organization at the site of at sites of social reproduction. They were organizing in the household, in the everyday life, and so on and so forth. And so that that I think is kind of like the direction that McNair is also trying to point towards. And you find and you find totally different ways of understanding class and these kind of classical Marxist parties, right? Later on, we're gonna, or, or maybe it was in the introduction, but it was. Uh, but later on, he's gonna talk about um, how their understanding of class was radically different. How it wasn't just people at the point of production, but it was. But it was a definition of um, everyone depended on the wage fund, which is usually the definition I uh, personally use. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um... We have a, a comment. Uh, the question communists today are faced with is this, which LARP is the best one? So that kind of uh, calls back to the historical uh, reenactment that we were talking about. But uh, Ian, to further your pivot, um, yeah, his um, definition of class is the expanded form that I think is properly Marxian that has to do more with the negative sense of expropriation than the positive sense of the, the power you can potentially get from exploitation. But um, anyway, by the way, if any if any um, LARP is is the best, it's dressing up in 19th century suits and then wandering around whatever city you're in and then just taking piles of notes in the way that Ingalls did. Why does no one LARP that, you know, why does nobody LARP British Library marks? I do. I do. That's what I'm I do. doing right now with my life. <laughs> I, just, I, just, right. I just sit around and read all day. And I'm not at work. Well, I mean, I do too, but I mean, I'm not at the British Library, man. You know, we could well, do better. I don't. I don't live in a town with a good library. But I have. I've been to the British Library. Who's that crickling there? Yeah, that's a, some crickling oh, and crackling sorry, from sorry. Don. God damn it, Don! Right. Well, people, I am actually. I think I'm coming down with something. So we're definitely going to finish this um, chapter. I don't want to go on too much longer because I'm not going to be able to um like concentrate and stuff like that but um what will we do donald have you been listening at all when you had to run your errand um no i haven't been... unfortunately i had to go get some stuff well talking and we started this chapter talking about well i don't know if you if you heard any of our stuff here talking about about how we should use history this paragraph here, but you know, when you are radically lost, it becomes necessary to retrace your steps. Do you have thoughts on that? Because I know you've been reading an awful lot of history. You know so much more history than I do. Say, for example, um, do you have thoughts on on how you uh, or do you apply this to your this type of logic to your history buffdom and you know, yeah, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, I actually kind of wrote an article about the first, second, and third internationals for Cosmonaut and kind of trying to draw the lessons from each international and then kind of use those to synthesize a, a, a more, what would I call, a, I guess a more holistic revolutionary strategy. It's kind of, you know, using a lot of McNair's ideas. So I guess I could, was just ripping off McNair. But um, I, I think that, the problem, what McNair is getting at here is that we, we can't just dismiss the Second International. Like what a lot of Leninist groups do, you know, Trotskyists, Maoists, Stalinists, either all three brands or whatever. Like they, they think that the Third International was basically the, the solution to the problem of the workers' movement. And that uh, essentially everything that we knew from the, the Second International is no, long, it no longer applies. And I think that we got to get out of that style of thinking. We need to be willing to critique the Third International, but we also need to be willing to, to learn positive things from the Second International. Because it's it, plenty of people are willing to critique negatively the Second International, but they're not willing to draw positive lessons from it. And plenty okay, of people are willing to draw positive lessons from the common turn, but they're not willing to you know critique it until like third period or say. Donald, can you give a, because a lot of people will be listening to this, will be going second international, third international. I don't have a goddamn clue what they're talking about. Do you want to give a very quick rundown of, say, one, two, and three? Okay, so 
the first international was basically a federation of different workers organizations and it was multi-tendency in the truest sense you had like you know lasallian state socialist you had the bakuninist the anarchist you had um and then kind of even you had marx who i guess you could say is kind of in the middle of the two and um Essentially, the idea of the international was to act as a coordinating body for the working class and uh, basically unite all the different tendencies of the working class movement into a common body of coordination. But what happened was like people realized, oh, shit, there's serious political differences here. For example, Marx and Engels were insistent that you know they run in elections and engage in political struggles. Whereas the Bakunist wing, the anarchists who would split were basically, no, that's, you know, conceding to the state. That's not real socialism. And can only spawn, you need spontaneous uprisings and support those. And, uh, you know, Bakunin wrote his famous, like, uh, statism and anarchy, where he basically says both Marx and LaSalle are statists and the true socialism is anti-state. And that led to, that was, and that was as much a, um, split over strategic and tactical differences over ideology because like i said marx thought it was very important to participate in mass politics so the second international kind of picks up from the first international but it's a little bit it's more centralized than people realize and there's more ideological homogeneity for example kotsky kicks out the anarchists in the second international there's a basically a, a unified there's more of a unified strategy even though there's disagreements and so the second international's biggest party was a uh, german SPD, which is really the focus of mcnair's polemics here and essentially they were anti-imperialist in word in the stuttgart congress of 1907 they all voted to reject colonialism and imperialism but what they didn't reject was national defense. And so when World War I came around, basically the idea was that we can support this war because it's a war of national defense against czarism. And so this splits the social democratic movement. And those who split from the social democratic movement on the anti-war side would eventually regroup around the Bolshevik Revolution as the Third International. And the Third International was formed by splitting parties from the Second International in, in most of the European parties. In third world countries, they were they actually built a lot of these parties from the ground up. But um, basically, the Third International kind of had this idea that the collapse of capitalism was coming, that it was, you know, the, the final hour of capitalism and we just needed to kind of uh, draw all the workers into battalions and just, you know, go on the offensive and just finish off global capitalism. But it turned out that it wasn't that simple, that the second international strategy of building a party and building mass support was still actually important. I mean, is there, is, is that, does that kind of make sense? And the third international would, would eventually like be disbanded by Stalin because he eventually like, he didn't give a shit about world revolution at a certain point because he was the nationalist piece of shit. <laughs> okay, no, that's really good because uh, I think a lot of people, myself included, I don't have a great knowledge of of the internationals and the difference to them. Um, okay, it is it's twenty past ten here. I know we've only been on for like an hour and a bit, but uh, I feel like I'm about to totally crash um so will we will we pick this up next week we didn't even get like two pages done of the chapter that's, <laughs> no, that a, sounds that's, good, a, new, Tom. that's a new low i know it's a new low but we did rehash <laughs> we, we did rehash the first episode um the first episode the first introduction chapter as well we kind of did talk on that for about 45 minutes as well so um i think we'll just wrap it up is there anything that we have discussed that people want to get back in on before we quit for the evening. I'll just say that um, it is kind of it is kind of funny, and I totally understand why we're only ended up why we only 
going through one page and it's that even though this book is a very easy read it's kind of like there's an there's an easy read on top of it but directly below it is a is a sea of information that you have to sift through i mean just based on what donald explained it's like you have to you have to already know all of these different internationals you mu- and you also have to know how the fourth international understands the prior three internationals to fully kind of understand this book it's it's a it's a it's an easy book to read but a hard book to fully kind of grasp i suppose well yeah mm-hmm. i'd say the thing about mcnair is that what he does is he does give you enough historical background where you know you can make his points or you can make his points but you've got to kind of research this on their own like when i met mcnair i asked him like what's what is a good book on the second international and he recommended me this biography of august bebel called um august bebel um god or his shadow emperor of the german workers and it was written by this right winger but it was like just full of all this information about you know the early social democratic party and what their politics were like and what kind of debates they had and you know it was obviously of course like the author was always like you know attacking babel for his utopian socialist uh, tendencies or whatever but point is that there's there's a lot of history behind all of this and you can always dig deeper and deeper and deeper in that but i think that mcnair does do a good job at portraying it in a in an honest way because he's a the man is a gold mine of historical knowledge like uh, yeah i will Derek, so or, I, I, I'll speak. Go up. no yeah i will i was gonna um, make a comment picking up a little bit on what on what donald said because the the only other writings i'd read on on this on a lot of this stuff before mcnair was either right-wing writing some of which are actually remarkably honest are Trotskyist writings also, which can be really good if they're not talking about, you know, their own party. Um, and this this book gave me a way to synthesize all these things in a way that wasn't as uh, like abstract as I don't know, reading Endnotes volumes one through four or something. Um, and also, th- there there is. There's not just a historical subtext to this. There, um, Lexi and Ian have both brought up there are theoretical subtext, um, and, you know, the debates between the analytical Marxists, the political Marxists, and world systems theory is kind of like M- McNair kind of synthesizes all of them um, and doesn't. And and not in a, and not in a cheap rip off way, but in a way that like if you understand them or know them, what he's speaking to makes sense. But if you don't know them, you can still get what he's saying, and that's hard to do, um, because like this is a pretty good intro level book, unlike most things that claim to be an intro level book. That's all I gotta say. Yeah, I was gonna say basically before I read this book, everything I had read on. The second international was basically Trotsky is like bashing it and saying, oh, they were just reformists in practice and revolutionary in talk sometimes. And that and but if you actually study the history more in depth, you realize, well, these people really did believe in revolution. And Kotsky really did like want to overthrow the state and, you know, bring about a world socialist republic. And Babel was actually feared by the bourgeoisie. And these people weren't just timid reformists, but there's this tendency to think that they were because they ran in elections and kind of built up an alternative culture. And I think the reason why the Second International is so important is because it shows us a way to, to actually build up the forces of the proletariat patiently over time. Or the Third International, you don't really, there's not really uh, much to learn on that. Yeah, I say we leave it there because okay. I, yeah. Okay, Let, let's have a look at the chat and say thanks to people. So we've had a a good bit of chat here between Jake P. We've got Oswell Spengler, Erica Whelan, Alex Stalwart in the chat again. We also have who else do we have? Um, we have Oswald yeah. Spengler. We have Oswald Spengler. Yeah, the Oswald Spengler. Uh oh. 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 Oh, uh, we have Jake P. Oh, did we mention our friend um, I D S K J F H S L K J D H 
F L K G. I'm sorry, J. That's a J. D H F. Did we mention? I forgot if we mentioned them. Yeah, it's actually pronounced Lidis Kvilis Lidis Kvidifer. Yeah, they're sorry, uh, a sorry. stalwart. I don't, I don't speak Flemish. No. <laughs> that that's true. Neither do I. Um, well, thanks everybody, and uh, we'll go offline now, and we'll hopefully do a, a proper show next week where we get more than two pages done. <laughs> Signing off. <laughs>